There you Ooh, go. That's it. There yeah, you know, like he created it. He's the recorder. Okay. Massive note noted. All right. So over to you, Richard. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks very much. So uh, thank you for setting this up, Kate. This should take yeah an hour. I mean, I think um, it's t- a lot of people on the call, so we'll d- do our best to um, sort of level set everybody, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present some slides. Uh, sorry about that. Just maybe uh, six or seven slides, just to give you the very high level overview of what Extreme is all about. <laughs> And then um, sort of go through a, 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 an agenda that talks about um, onboarding, how we bring our customers on board, uh, on board to the platform and how we do that come with you guys as well. Uh, how the money flows through the system. Um, there's a lot of uh, regulatory and legislative requirements and uh, around mo- movement of money. It's a very sort of regulated business. So I want to sort of explain how that works so that when you're talking to your customers you can explain some of that yourself you don't have to be an expert at it obviously and we're here to help you but certainly knowing uh, a decent a chunk about how it's it's uh, regulated helps explain to your customers why things are done a certain way okay Um, and why certain information is needed which might be over and above information required to open a sort of non financial type of account. So so that's the onboarding process I'll go through. Uh, Next, the flow of money, how the money flows into the system, through the system and out. And then finally, I mean, I'll, you know, I'll do this sort of combined with the demo uh, of the actual platform itself. Okay. So that's the sort of four points of the agenda. Um, I would suggest that, you know, as far as questions are concerned, I I don't really mind. If people want to sort of interject right in the middle of something I'm uh, talking about, that's absolutely fine by me. Um, sometimes thoughts come into your head related to a, a recent question or a customer you're working with, and you don't want to let that thought go. So I don't mind being interrupted. Um, there's a lot of people on the line, so uh, I'm not sure if you just start talking, I'll stop and listen. Okay. Um, so with that said, um, I'm going to start with the slides now. My first question is, can everybody see a slide? I'm assuming, Kate, you can see a slide that says extreme overview. Yep, I can see that. Okay, so um, this is the company, right? We are a, a fintech company. That's the, the, how the world classifies us. Um, we're in the business of, of moving money. We've been around since about 2012. We're about 10 years old. And we only do one thing, and that's focus on moving money globally and currency exchange. I guess that was two, but moving money and processing and currency exchange is what we focus on. The product, not surprisingly, is 100% in the cloud. There's nothing to install on PCs. Uh, we have a mobile app, I would say, 90% of our business is done through our APIs, okay? So we consider ourselves, and we are an infrastructure company, very heavily API-driven, although we're not going to focus too much on the API in this, on this uh, uh, overview. Um, just to understand that's the prime way people de- deploy extremists through our API. Um, the uh, somewhat unique thing is that we are not just API-focused. Um, some companies sort of focus only on API or focus on a platform. We kind of do both, Okay. And the reason being is that uh, we find that we get uh, more customer acceptance when they can, you know, sort of deploy extreme through the platform. And then maybe in the future, get more um, advanced, they can start to deploy our API. And I suspect that's over time that will happen with um, with you guys as well. Uh, we process in over 130 currencies um, in the US. We have about 200, over 250,000 companies that are registered to, registered to extreme for the purpose of either sending or receiving money. We register about 15,000 uh, individuals to the system um, every month um, for receiving payments, primarily individuals that receive payments, one sort of another. And our entire business model is driven through our partners like yourselves. So we are not, we don't do direct customers. We invariably, um, if they come to us, we will refer them to a customer in a specific vertical. So we are very horizontal. We do payments, that's it, in various markets of which incentives is a big uh, and a decent growing po- uh, portion of our business. Um, um, and like I said, we do it all through partners. So how does that look kind of like this, right? Extreme sits top or bottom, no matter how you, depends how you look at it. And then our partners like yourselves have some you know, global application, uh, verticalized application typically that re- want payments added to it. And um, typically our partners are making money out of this. This, We're not really selling to our partners as in a typical sales cycle. We're, we're, uh, you know, bringing them onto the platform as a partner and and to generate a new revenue stream. Okay. So typically through either a a cost plus model or a rev share, um, we charge at a transaction based level and allow our partners to make money out of this. So people who work with Extreme, uh, like yourselves, are actually making money out of Extreme. Um, and then obviously you obviously downstream at the bottom, you have your customers and they're the people that are 
uh, you know, as part of your application, they're wanting to move money. Okay. Um, the the mark we don't specifically focus on any markets, right? So we're not just in the tech space or this space or that space. We do tend to uh, be mostly in the tech space. Um, I suspect that might be partly because our partners uh, are in the tech space, um, but I think it's also partly due to um, you know more forward thinking companies. I guess are open to using more modern fintech platforms than perhaps some more traditional companies. But we're seeing that change a lot, uh, and uh, we're seeing you guys, you know, bring on customers that have been around more than just uh, a few years, and, and that's all good. So that's the business model, indirect model, going through partners. The key services, I apologize for the speed I'm talking, but the uh, key services are listed here. There's five of them. The first is onboarding. Now, onboarding is, you know, as you know, is a fancy word for people registering to your website and doing stuff, right? Um, the one comment I will make about onboarding in any financial company is it is it is complicated, right? Unlike just signing up for a uh, a regular account for you know a SaaS application, um, we are moving money, and this is not specific to Extreme. So there are a certain amount of additional information required on the people we onboard um, about their company, and uh, that information requirement varies by country. US tends to be slightly less, which start to get into more exotic currencies, uh, excuse me, companies, uh, countries, thank you, and currencies. You'll, you'll find the questions and the answers we need are more uh, sophisticated. We need to know more about the companies before we onboard. Okay. So onboarding is uh, uh, part of our system. It's designed to be as easy as possible. Okay. And I will demonstrate that um, as part of the demo. Um, obviously, we are moving money, right? So we're going to be receiving money. Now, um, receiving money is is uh, you know, how, it, how your wallets get populated, or in your case, your customers' wallets. So if you particular uh, pick a specific uh, one of your customers like Cohisti or Siena, they need to fund their wallet for the purpose of disbursement. And so we have the ability to take that money in, whether it comes from you or comes from the actual uh, uh, customer directly, um, customer being the remitter, Siena, Cohisti, et cetera. Um, that money can come to us through a variety of ways. Receiving money, that's how it comes into the system. That's how it funds wallets. Once the money's into the system, um, we, we pay. We process and pay, okay? Uh, and effectively, what we're doing is we're sort of moving money from uh, the Cohesity wallet into the beneficiary company or individual wallet. Happens instantaneously. Um, unlike wires and ACH and more bank-to-bank -bank transfers, which take a day or two days, a movement of money it seems like is absolutely instant, okay? So the moment a money, money has been received in a beneficiary wallet, they have been paid and it belongs to them, okay? Even if they haven't transferred it to their bank account, it belongs to them. Think like PayPal for business, maybe. So um, managing the money is moving between wallets. Uh, money can be currency exchanged in the platform um, and, uh, you know, uh, move from one currency to another. Like I said, we have, uh, you know, the ability to sort of, currency exchange in, in many, many currencies, um, and our rates are super competitive, definitely better than banks. So that's the third uh, area, managing the money. Transferring the money, once you've moved the money into a beneficiary wallet, then they, they have the choice on how to move it out. We call this transferring money out, um, and that could be to a bank, to a virtual visa, a gift card, or a check. Okay, so we have we call those endpoints. And uh, depending on what your customer wants to do, and your customers will be varied on how they want to do things. Some of them are happy to have the money received into a wallet. Some of them want the money sent direct to the endpoint. So they might say, okay, um, 360, I'm, uh, I want you to just pay this you know, company in France, drop it in their wallet, and then they can choose, self-serve choose to link their bank and transfer it out, transfer it to a prepaid card, whatever they choose, they have, they have the options. Um, so that's customer one. Some customers might say to you, no, 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 we don't want it sent to a wallet. We want it directly sent to our bank account. OK, and that's called extreme direct. The first one is called extreme choice because we're giving uh, beneficiaries choice. The second one is called extreme direct because we are transferring direct. OK, so you've basically got a level of flexibility to keep your customers happy. Some prefer the wallet model. Some say, no, no, just send it to my bank or a check and, and we can do both. And then finally, uh, and probably the, the most uh, extensive subject is compliance. Right. So we are, as I mentioned earlier, very highly regulated and our goal is to keep you in compliance too. Um, so I try, we try to impart upon our partners uh, what the regulatory requirements are, but really protect you from having to understand and know them other than what you need to tell your customers and explain to them why certain things happen. 
Um, all this is built on our wallet, wallet architecture. Um, and I'll come back and talk a little bit more about compliance and our onboarding process as I did the demo. Okay. I have a so question. This, yeah, sure. So on the choice, um, is that at the individual level or is that at the like customer level, program level? So, you know, if it, as a as an individual user, can you say, oh, I want it on my card. Another one says, I want it in my bank account. Um, yes, it's both. So there are two types of account in Extreme. There's a company account and a personal account. If you're paying money from Cohesi to, to a company, the company has, has the choice, okay? They can, if we're doing wallet payments, so they can log in, they can use Extreme Choice, and they can decide to link and transfer to a bank or link and transfer to a prepaid card or whatever. The same for individuals. It's exactly the same. So if we pay an individual, they'll have a slightly different account. When they log in, there's sort of less features. They're more personal features. Um, but they have the same choices. So a, an individual can uh, receive money. I've just received uh, you know, 100 US dollars. They can transfer it to their bank, a check, a prepaid card, or one of over you know, 400 gift cards. So they have choice. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. That's amazing. Um, just, just one little addendum to that is that just remember that sometimes your customers might say, no, no, we don't want our beneficiaries to have choice, right? We want to pay everybody gift cards, Amazon gift cards. Well, we can do that, okay? And the mechanics behind that is what we actually do technically is we move it into their wallet and then bounce it straight to the gift card, okay? Mm -hmm. They don't know that. They just, they just get a gift card, a digital gift card, right? But just remember, Extreme Choice is when they have the choice in the wallet. Extreme Direct is when we move direct to the endpoint. So you can, it's pretty flexible. You can, uh, you can tell the customers you have the choice. Uh, and to be honest, this slide here kind of uh, represents that. So on the left here, you've got the funding. How does money come into the system? And then you've got the wallet movement, money from wallet to wallet. And then the beneficiary of that payment, company or individual, can transfer to the to the different endpoints, and we're adding additional endpoints. We're in the process of adding um, Bitcoin, uh, crypto as well as an endpoint in the near future. So that's the architecture. We call it our intelligent wallet architecture, and I'll come to explain a little bit more about that. So yeah, so this reiterates what we just said: extreme choice, recipients choose method, extreme direct. You, as in three hundred and sixty, choose the uh, well. Your customer probably will tell you, you know. 360, we would like to receive all the payments on a, a specific card or a visa prepaid or direct to the bank. So you can say, yep, we can do that. Okay, extreme direct. Um, now, uh, one of the uh, design points of extreme is what we call our uh, manager accounts. So we're very well aware of uh, our indirect sales model through our partners like uh, 360. You're, you downstream have a bunch of many, many customers that you want to manage. And you don't want to be logging into you know, 10, 20, 30 plus accounts to manage those accounts. So you get what we call a, a manager account. OK, this would be this one here. This is a 360 account. And what we do is we connect you, think like LinkedIn, connect you to your customer accounts. So this architecture is called a connected architecture. It means it's a single point of login for your 360 administrators uh, for managing, tracking, reviewing, um, all the data and the flows that are happening on your customer accounts. So in this example here, this would be 360, this would be Cohesity, this would be Sienna and so on, okay? Um, and, you know, your designated admins can log in, check the Sienna account, check the Cohesity account and see when money was funded, when money uh, was transferred out, et cetera. And the reason for that is because you're, they're your customer, you're supporting them, they're asking you questions. And this gives you that level of visibility and support to help manage them, set them up, um, get them, you know, get their banks linked. You could link a bank for them. You can do all kinds of stuff for them through the user interface without having to log into their account. And this is a very unique set of functionality, um, only applicable to our integrated partners like yourselves. Okay. So that's what we call the connected architecture. Um, obviously, once, uh, you know, uh, you're connected to them, you can manage them. Um, in certain circumstances, you may want to be connected to beneficiary accounts, okay? Typically not, but there are sometimes reasons for that. Maybe a beneficiary is having some problems and you're doing it almost as a white glove service to your remitters. So Cohesity say, oh, one of our beneficiaries in France is having all kinds of problems, right? Well, we, we, we can't help them. 
can you help us? And you could say, okay, and you can connect yourself to this account. We will guide you through that process. And then you can have visibility into the beneficiary account and you can help them. So it's sort of a, an additional white glove service you might want to do on special circumstances, but typically not. I mean, the beneficiary accounts are obviously thousands of them, tens of thousands. And so uh, that's, that's where the mass volume of, of accounts reside. Okay, compliance. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, we are regulated. Um, and what we like to do is sort of educate our partners on what that means. OK, we technically cover it. So in the system, there are real time what we call KYC. That means know your customer. Uh, basically, the regulations require that in any transaction where money moves from point A to point B, you have to know the sender and the beneficiary. And you have to know, you know, not everything about them. You have to know a lot more about the sender than you do the beneficiary. OK, so it's all about money laundering. OK, that's why it says real time anti money laundering rules. Um, and we get audited and checked and they say, OK, these random transactions, the money went from this person to that or Sienna to this. Can you, you know, can you provide us with information about the remitting company, Sienna? OK, and we are required by law to say, yeah, this is the information. So that collection of information is part of onboarding. And the reason we ask for that information during onboarding is for that very reason that we can prove or, or to the regulators that we are fully knowledgeable about the sender and the beneficiary of any payment in the system. And it's all about, it all comes from the 2002 post, uh, you know, 9-11 Patriot Act. That's what triggered all these rules and things got really tightened up on money. movement. They, they sort of discovered if you could control money, movement, you could control uh, nefarious behavior with um, terrorist organizations. So that's where it all comes from. So we track it in real time and we do it through uh, profiles. OK, uh, and the way we do it is we try and lower the barrier to entry and only ask for additional data as the activity of that particular company increases. Um, and we do this, and I'll come back to this. I don't think you have to remember it, but we um, let companies sign up. We don't do a very deep dive on them until they ask to start sending money. And they will fill out what we call an advanced, uh, advanced pro uh, profile. And again, I'll demo it. And during that advanced profile, we will ask for additional information. You may be, a, 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 you know, who's the, who are the beneficiary uh, own primary owners of a company who owns more than 25% and there'll be checks done. The, and then once those checks are done and the company is approved, they'll be able to start remitting money. So any, and this is a process for people who are sending money. So they're effect, effectively your customers. It's not a process for the beneficiaries of payments. So it's only a small set of customers. Normally it takes 24 to 48 hours to go through the, pro, the process of, of uh, um, onboarding them, checking the information and getting them uh, up and running. Uh, and once they're up and running, they'll have an identity level. How much information do we have on them will set their identity level. And that sets their limits, how much they can send, how much they can receive, how, ma how many transfers they can do a day, how many sends, et cetera. OK, so it's pretty sophisticated. The point is, is we protect you from all the legislation around that kind of stuff and we control it. Right. And make sure that not, that uh, your customers are not doing anything um, out of compliance. OK, so that's the compliance thing. And finally, uh, tax as well. So I'll just be very quick on this. Um, we are categorized as a third party settlement organization. Okay, it's a very specific um, tax um, identification by the tax authorities. And what it means is that when we're sending money to beneficiaries of payments, it's deposited in their wallet. And the requirement for uh, withholding tax is not on you, not on us, it's on the beneficiary. So it's all on the beneficiary. And we, as a company, Extreme, we provide the, the appropriate documentation, which is a 1099K in the UK, uh, in the US, sorry, um, uh, P11D in the UK and so on. We provide the appropriate tax documentation to the beneficiaries of payments, individuals or companies. The bottom line is you don't need to worry about it. Okay, it's all, it's all managed in Extreme. If anybody asks you about tax, you say, yep, it's managed Extreme. They provide the relevant tax documentation and we, you, know, you can grab links on explain how it's done, but that's how taxes managed uh, in the system. Makes life very easy. Okay, last slide. Um, deployment options, right? Today we have three, okay? Uh, to be honest, widgets, we're phasing them out. They're going away. So you can really consider this as two. Uh, web and mobile platform, uh, that is that you, uh, this is what uh, 360 do primarily today, I believe, is you submit payment files to us. So if Sienna or Coisti or, or want to make a payment, you submit a file to us, pay this person, this email address, this company, this email address, this wallet, this amount of money, okay? 
Um, and you submit that to us and we will process within hours. Okay, assuming there's funds in the account, we'll process, be done. Uh, option B, uh, which is more real time, is our API. And like I said, the API does exactly the same as the platform and uh, mass file submission does, but it's done through technology, through an interface. And it's the great new, the thing about it is it's automated. It's no human intervention, right? So payments can be much, much more real time. Okay. And everybody, you know, appreciates that. You can pay your customers quicker. Um, and so the API is about 125, 126 calls. Uh, we focus heavily on our API. Um, and over time, we'll encourage 360 to get. But I think uh, Jason actually said that he was looking at doing that sometime mid next year, right? So the API is something that we're very proud of and we push very hard. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that's, like I said, the core of our business. Okay. So uh, with that said, that's all my slides. I'm going to jump over to the platform right now. And, uh, and do a demo. Give me a couple of seconds here to get myself organized. Um, one thing to be uh, note is that I um, mistakenly installed Windows 11 and it's caused all kinds of problems on the website. So I apologize for this error you're gonna see. Um, if I reload this a few times, it should go away. As you can see, it wasn't a good idea to do this. Okay, all right, so this is extreme. Um, this is on the dev site, development site. And like I said, it is gonna glitch out. It's nothing to do with anything other than I upgraded to Windows 10, uh, Windows 11. Um, but um, I'm gonna give you a demo. Now remember, there's a couple of things. There is a um, two types of account, okay? Um, company account and a personal account. Today, I'm not gonna focus on a personal account. Uh, it looks exactly like a company account. Uh, with less features uh, because it's for individuals. Um, it, uh, it's also available on a mobile app. So you can download the Extreme mobile app for individuals um, from the App Store as, as a, like any other app. So this is uh, something you could check out as well. But I'm going to be focused today on company accounts. And the thing to remember about company accounts is they are for companies, obviously. Um, whether you're remitting or receiving as a company, it's the same type of account. It's a company account. All right. Um, for our aggregated partners like yourself, integrated partners like 360, you have a company account. The difference is you'll have a company account with a few more features. Man in your case, manager features. Um, in the case of remitters, they'll have the same company account, but they'll have more features related to funding and sending money because that's what they're doing. They're sending money. Remitters are people that send money. Beneficiaries have the same account. Again, a company account. They just have less features. They just have features for receiving, looking at their balances, transferring to banks, et cetera. So I'm going to log in now. Um, excuse me a second here. I'm going to resize this. Yeah. Log in as a company account now. I'm already logged in. So here we go. This is um, this is a company account. Okay. So what you'll notice is, um, as I resize it slightly here, you'll notice that it's it's a financial account. It's much like a bank account. Okay. Um, with some differences, which I'll highlight. Okay. Um, when you first go into the account, the first thing you're going to do is see a sort of a, an overview of a selected wallet. And in a company account, um, you can have any number of wallets. So there's a slight nomenclature difference we use versus bank accounts, right? We talk about an account being logging in. This is your account. Um, and within an account, you can have multiple currency wallets. So you can have any number of USD wallets, GBP wallets, Canadian dot, and so on. Okay. And creating a wallet is nothing more than clicking, if I go over to the wallets link here, clicking create wallet. Okay. So when a company creates a wallet, think of it like creating a bank account almost. Extreme sits on top of about a little over 100 uh, global bank accounts and uh, in, uh, in many, many currencies. Um, and the concept here is that once you're onboarded, you can create an account with just a click of a button. Now, why do you want to do that? Well, your customers are going to say, uh, want to maybe fund in different currencies. So firstly, if they're going to fund, send money in, in British pounds, they're going to need a British pounds wallet for the money to go into. That's the reason you need a different currency wallet. Um, they might want to... Um, separate out USD wallets, right? So they might, for example, want to uh, have, you know, one wallet for the Q1 MDF program, uh, one wallet to uh, another wallet for rebates and so on. So you can create as many wallets and in the same currency as required, you could 
sort of programmatize them, you know, link them to a specific program and organize it how you like. Okay, so it's very flexible, right? In this particular example, you know, this, this demo account has many, many wallets. Um, you probably wouldn't have this many, but you can see here, there's a whole variety of different currencies of wallet, okay? And wallets are like a bank account. They're a, where a container for money. They're where transactions are stored and recorded. Um, any inbound money transfers to other wallets or outbound money uh, is stored inside a, a wallet. And you can see here many different currencies. If I pick on, um, you know, uh, this one here, for example, click on activity, this is the transactions that are going on the wallet. Okay. So you can see there's seven uh, transactions outbound, none received, and so on, right? So a quick set. Now, the good news is this is the data that you can view for your connected customers. Okay. So you yourself, when I say you, I mean 360, are not necessarily moving money in and out. You're not a emitter, but your customers are. Okay. And in a minute, I'll go down to the connected uh, uh, screen and show you what that means. But basically, what it means is that you can view the wallets. Um, of your customers. So you have that visibility, as I mentioned earlier, to support them, to see the transactions, to dig down into the details, to find out when the transaction took place, right down to the finest uh, little detail. So if a customer says, well, we didn't get paid, you can go, well, yeah, actually you did, you were paid at, you know, on the 12 8 at uh, 107 p.m. So this is a kind of support and level of access um, we give you. And you can do some things like that. So, well, I never got the email. Well, okay. You can click the resend alert email and you on behalf of your customers can support them through this, the use of this, uh, this interface. Um, you'll notice this particular account has a, uh, a red star. That means that it is manager approved. This is what 360 has. And so what it means is you have additional features above an ordinary account. Okay. Um, so, you know, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but if you take a look at the, um, yeah, I'll come back to that in a minute. I'll, I'll show you in a minute some of the manager features that you have over and above a normal account. So just to, to recap, when you log into Extreme, you're going to see a bunch of wallets. The wallets are, are containers where money is stores. They're multi-currency. Uh, we, can, we, can, we have about 42 different currencies that we can hold, and about 130 that can be transferred to. Um, and those wallets are highly flexible. OK, if you were to use the API, you could actually embed those wallets inside your own application and have people stay inside uh, your customers apps and actually view those wallets. So I mentioned earlier about the flow of money through the system. And the first part, point of flow is, is actually how do you get money into Extreme? OK, uh, and that's through the fund option. So most of our customers uh, simply wire, wire money. OK, so, you know, in the case of uh, Siena, right? you're going to have to get money into the system on behalf of Siena. You're going to wire the money in with a specific reference code and it will just show up in the system. Um, what we typically recommend is that if you are going to fund, let us know in advance. And in a particular case, it would be, you know, a bank transfer. Uh, you would literally say, okay, extreme. We're about to send, you know, uh, $10,000 in on behalf of Siena. Um, and you'll go through this screen and, and, uh, and, notify us that the money is going to be coming into us so we know it now when you do that you're going to create a pending inbound transaction because basically what you're saying is um give it a little description here agree to some terms and conditions and then you request an invoice well in this case i request an invoice so sometimes customers say oh we want you to invoice us for the ten thousand dollars if you don't want a uh, invoice then you just don't select that through that process but this is notifying us that you're about to wire us ten thousand dollars on behalf of your customer or for yourself and then we look out for that those funds. Moment they're in there, this transaction becomes cleared, and it'll be a, a it'll add to the balance, which for this account is is huge. Okay, so funding is about moving money into the system. Okay, it's moving money in. I mentioned uh, funding through um, bank transfers. The other way of funding is uh, just for your, if your customers ever say, well, you know, we want to do it in a more automated way not send you, one op other option for the US is ACH debit. So if your customer approves this, we can pull the money from their account. They'll be presented with a plaid screen. I don't know if you've ever, you probably experienced this in other products where they, they have to log in to their bank account, username, password, one-time password, one time. And then from that point on, they can just choose ACH debit, select the amount and click uh, transfer. And within 24 hours or less, actually, the money is moved into the system and it's a pull versus a push. OK, so that's another offer uh, opportunity. Now, I know there's a lot of information I'm sending. I'm telling you, um, but, you know, uh, 
you know, over time, as you talk to customers, you know, you'll uh, we'll provide you with sort of links to our support documents to help back up this uh, this stuff as well. The third way of funding your uh, wallet is through the exchange function. That's moving money from one currency to another. And not and just to remind you, you know, currency exchange is a big part of Extreme's business. Um, it's part of our revenue source, so we like currency exchange. Uh, we make money on it. The um, uh, our rates are great. Okay, they're way better than banks um, because we have such uh, volume and uh, with over 100 banks, we're able to get very good uh, deals. So, um, yeah, that's an option for customers. They can move money in. Sometimes they they decide to do this because they want to send out a specific currency. In other words, they might fund in dollars, but they want to run a program in France in euros, and they want to send specific amounts of money. We want to send, you know, 100 euros, right? Not, you know, send dollars and have it converted. So they can do a currency exchange and then run a program in a specific, uh, in a different currency. So that's the funding side. Money moving into the system. Once it's in the system, you're going to want to disperse those funds. Okay. Now, what happens in reality is, you know, you guys through your generated through your system, you send us a file and we process. Okay. That's called what we call mass pay. Okay. So mass pay is option three here, where you submit a payment file and we process. Okay. Now, how do you? And I'll come back to the others in a minute. But how do you submit that file? Well, you just upload it. OK, so the mass pay comes with a template. Uh, it's a standard spreadsheet template. You complete the template, all the fields and template, and then you upload the mass payment file to us. It goes into a queue uh, with a submission ID, SUB and a number, a unique uh, code. And then that is processed. OK, so it's a very sort of quick and easy way of getting things done. Our partners typically generate that file uh, with using the file format automatically in their system, submit it through here, and then we process. Now, in the case of your customers, you're going to be submitting files for them, okay? And under the connected menu, you can do that. You can select the customer and submit a file on their behalf. And the difference is, is that you'll be moving money from their remitter wallet, Cohesity, into the beneficiary versus 360 because you're not making payments. You're doing them on behalf of your customer, okay? So sending payments is the act of moving money into the beneficiary wallet. And remember, when you've moved money into a beneficiary wallet, they're paid, Okay, it doesn't have to go to the bank or the gift card or the prepaid visa to be considered paid. It's paid. It's called custodial ownership of funds. It's no different to PayPal. When you pay somebody in a wallet in PayPal, they're paid. Okay, so that was the mass payment option. Embedded payments is the API. I won't talk too much about that. That's a that's a, a real time option. Um, but if you ever have to do um, one time payments, you know, you you pay a bunch of people and then you forget. Oh, we we should have paid this guy or this company, you can just simply go to the user interface and just make a payment. We call it a simple send, right? So simple send is literally, you know, like any other, like Venmo, PayPal, you could just find anybody in the system um, and send them a payment, okay? You wanna send a payment to, you know, a null MG, I can't pronounce that, but that's how you do it. So you can search them by name, company, email, mobile number, the usual thing, make a single point payment. Um, and uh, it's a facility. It's probably something you may not use, but it's in the system. If you want to send something like not money, but you want to send them a gift card, we would consider that an advance send. And you can do the same thing. OK, so you can make a personal payment to an individual as a check, a link reward um, or direct to the bank and so on. So you as 360 can make ad hoc payments just through the user interface um, to your customers. OK, so that's the sending function. Really, that's the key paying. That's when you're that's what you're doing. You're paying people. Now, if you remember. Um, once the money has been received in the beneficiary wallet, um, they get notified. You've just received, uh, you know, $5,000 from Cohesity. Um, they've been paid. Now, once it's in their beneficiary wallet, the uh, beneficiary company, um, assuming it's an extreme choice thing where we pay to a wallet, they just can, they get the alert. One of the administrators of that account logs in and they see the funds. They can see the funds are in the wallet. Okay. So they will be notified and they'll see they've received the payment. Maybe it's into this. Um, I'm just going to pick a random wallet here. If I just use a USD wallet for the sake of uh, demonstration purposes. So this, you know, maybe this is a beneficiary of a payment in uh, in the US. They received the payment and they've got a balance, a huge balance, excuse that. And they just want to transfer the funds out. OK, so they want to transfer it to the bank. They just click on the transfer option. And this is for moving money out of their wallet to an endpoint. OK, in this case, it's a bank. It doesn't have to be. And maybe they want to want to move it to a virtual debit card or a check. OK, um, we also have another bank option, which is called rapid transfer. So 
um, if you're familiar, in the, and this is specific to the US at the moment, um, but you know, if you send an ACH, if you, if you transfer via standard transfer, that's going to be ACH, um, or you know, or in the US, and that's um, you know, maybe it takes a day or so. Um, rapid transfer takes you know seconds, right? So you put in your debit card, corporate debit card, or for an individual, his personal debit card, and then link, link it one time, and then the, the transfer is within a few seconds, right? Um, there's a fee for that; it's one percent capped at ten dollars, um, but it is instant. So a user can choose; they're going to have a free option, the standard transfer, or make a rapid transfer option through here. So this is withdrawing money out of the system to an endpoint, banks, checks, gift cards, deb, uh, virtual visas, and so on. Okay, uh, with rapid transfer being a recent addition for instant bank transfer. Um, Richard, so, since it, yeah, this ahead. is Scott. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but since we're talking about fees, are there fees for our um, clients' partners to transfer out of the Extreme Wallet into their bank account? And if there are, can you explain the fees depending on where they're transferring to? Yeah. So for forty countries, um, for forty countries, it's free. OK, we call it the technical. But what we call it is low value, high value rails. Right. It's a technical term in some countries of which we have 40 and they're the uh, major currencies. So UK, Canadian dollars in, within the US, it's all free Okay, to transfer to the bank using the standard transfer method. OK, it's free. 40 countries free for the ones that are not in that list of 40 countries, which covers the majority, uh, the more exotic currencies we have to use what we call a wire, high value wire. There are no low value rails to those countries, right? No cheap, cheap methods of moving money between banks, right? So there's a fee. So those uh, in more exotic currencies, yes, there is a fee. For, for individuals, it's $6. And for companies, it's 10, okay, $10, okay? Um, so if ever a company, so, you know, Coincity sends money to somebody in uh, the UK, they received it in their bank account, they're gonna transfer it to their bank, Standard transfer, it's free. Okay, if they choose rapid transfer, I think rapid transfer is not available in the UK. It's a bad example. If it's the US, it'll be free. If they choose rapid transfer, it'll be one percent uh, uh, capped at ten dollars, but they've got a free option. If uh, Kahisti sends money to a, a wallet for an Indian company, just picking one at random, uh, that's an exotic currency. We don't have low value rails to India. When the company or individual goes to uh, links their bank and transfers their bank, they will be charged a fee. Six dollars for individuals. Ten dollars for a company. Okay, so that's something to be aware of. Now, our goal is to get these all to zero. Okay, to get them all down to zero for that transfer, and it's happening slowly. We just added two more countries in the last uh, two months. Um, uh, I forget which countries there were. I think one was you. I can't remember which ones. There one was a South American country. I think it might have been Colombia. But either way, so so we have we are adding to more more and more of them. Everything else is free: bank check, debit card, gift cards. That's all free. Um, sorry, one quick question. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, uh, so the uh, for um, sorry, an exotic currency, you said, wouldn't there be two different fees, though? Because uh, you're saying that there is a flat fee for a standard transfer as well uh, as well in those countries. But then what would, what's the um, escalated kind of fee for the rapid transfer? So rapid transfer is only available in the US. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes, right. You did Best Buy. Sorry about yeah. That. So, so um, it uses the Visa network. And Visa, and, and Visa are actually at the moment experimenting, trialing rapid transfer in other countries, okay? But it isn't available today. But I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to see that come out within the next year or so, okay? Um, and, and I don't know what the fees are because basically we just pass those fees on. We don't really make a lot of money out of it. It's more of a pass-through fee to Visa. It's, it's a reverse credit card transaction is actually what it is. Um, and there's interchange fees for those. So that's why that fee exists. Hey Richard, it's it's Grant. I just want to Hi, clarify Grant. one thing for hey, hey, I just want to clarify one thing for everyone who's who's listening. So, you know, when we 360 set up an arrangement like this for one of our clients, let's say Cohesity, like R Richard keeps using, there is a fee that we charge Cohesity for the movement of funds, and it's basically a per transaction fee, and that's between us and Cohesity. Separately, when Cohesity, when we make payments to Cohesity's partners, the end recipients, these fees here that we're talking about are the responsibility of those end recipients, not Cohesity. So I just want to make sure we're clear on the two different sets of um, fee structures and who's responsible for which. Does, does that answer your original question, Scott?
I just, I, I know how the fees work. I was doing it for everybody else, <laughs> but yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, well, I'm no. doing the same thing. So forgive me. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Cause I know that we charge, for instance, um, $10 per transaction that we do, um, let's say for Sienna when we pay their partners. But then this fee that Richard is talking about is separate from that. Correct. And, and, right. and, and Richard, I don't know if you know this, but generally speaking, the, the types of arrangements that we have um, primarily are through the Perks platform today. Right. Do, we, do we have more of the extreme choice or the extreme direct? What, what, do, you, what do we see more? I, I think oh, that's something I'd have to check with Chris. Direct. It's direct, is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, so, so what are you, a majority of ours, I thought was on choice. We just recently started offering yeah, you're, direct. You're correct, Amber. Um, most of the beneficiaries that, that get paid through us are on choice. Yeah, now, I, oh, I, do, okay. choice. I, I, I do expect to see more moving to direct, but at this moment, the majority of them are on choice. Oh, All of my clients are choice. Mm -hmm. I thought we were masking off some of those options. So thank you. Um, but Rick, this is Amber. I do have a question about the direct option. Um, is there a fee? Because I, I thought there was a fee associated with the direct option. And who pays that fee? Is it 360 or does it come out of the partner balance, the beneficiary balance? Um, it's It depends on how we've worked it out with you. I mean, you're right, because what happens is with the... With direct, if you think about it, it's, there's two hops. There's to the wallet, and that's the send fee, uh, mm -hmm. which you, you char you're charging your customers, whether it's a you know cost plus or percentage or whatever. And then there's another fee. And this remember, this is only if it's, it's one of the high value exotic currencies, right? There may be another fee. That's that ten dollars I talked about. Um, in that case, it, it, the ch we normally charge you guys. We would charge you guys, and the expectation that you would roll that onto your customer as part of the uh, process i think it hasn't really been an issue to date probably because we don't do if any i think exotic payments for you guys right now um non non in any high value customers but yeah we would we would charge you okay okay i, I think and just before you go on richard i think it's also good for everybody to understand like what we're really talking about here are primarily co-op and MDF payments. Let's, let's establish that right now. Like that, that is our main use case right now for Extreme. Now we're in talks with Extreme about how this could potentially apply to other uh, modules or program types like a, like a SPIF or even a consumer rebate or a VR payment. Uh, but for now, just think it'll be easier if we all just think co-op and MDF for now as we wrap our heads around it. Good. Okay. So, um, so fun, we, you know, we refer to this, if I just sort of, you know, a little bit of summary here, the, the wallets are where money's stored. I mentioned that fund send transfer. We talk about it in turn as FST, right? It's just a, a fund center fund moving money into the extreme platform, funding a beneficiary, a remitter wallet. Send is moving money from a wallet to a beneficiary wallet and transfer is moving the funds out to an external endpoint, a bank. And that's sort of how we uh, have named it. Um, exchange is currency exchange. I've talked about that. There's not much to talk about that. Um, the next area I wanted to check on was the profile, uh, talk about was the profile. And like I said, I've got some uh, issues here related to my Windows implementation. Thank you. Okay. So here's the profile, right? So everybody um, that's registered to Extreme, every company that's registered to Extreme obviously has an account. Account within an account is a, um, uh, uh, a bunch of wallets right now. One of the things a little different about Extreme is at the, what we do is once we have one instance of any global company account in Extreme, we don't have two or three. If IBM sign up to Extreme, they're going to have one account. Okay. I don't, you know, even if they've got 10 different offices using Extreme or 100 or one account. So it's a level above the normal account, right? And the reason for this is this makes onboarding a whole lot easier for global companies, okay? So we will onboard IBM, okay? And if they have, you know, 12, you know, 100 subsidiaries, each subsidiary account that wants access to the system will have an admin access to the same account. 
Now, within that account, they can log in. They might have restricted access to certain wallets within the account. Okay, so IBM France can only see the IBM France wallets and IBM Germany can only see the IBM Germany wallets. Um, but they're not going to create a new account. And the reason for this is simply it reduces the, the um, number of error payments by a, you know, a hundredfold. If you have multiple accounts in the system, it's like, should we pay in this company, that company? It became so complicated. Um, this model has solved that problem 100%. But it does, it does sometimes create a sales hurdle, okay? And that is people in IBM France say, why do I have to log into the same account as IBM? We're a different company. Well, it, yes, but no, you're not, are you? You're really the same company. But we, can, we, we manage that by saying, yes, but when you log in, you only have access to what you're allowed to have access to, certain wallets within that account, only the IBM France wallets. Over there. And that's the architecture, okay? And um, if you go to the admin section, this is where it's reflected, okay? Um, you're going to have one master admin. There is only one master admin per account, okay, per global account. Um, and that person is not responsible for administering the whole system. He's just responsible for creating other admins. The only thing a master admin can do that other admins can't is delete, delete, um, delete admins, okay? So he has that level of control. So you'll have one master admin, then you can have as many manager and standard admins as you like. And the manager admins are typically regional guys. The, the guy who's gonna manage the, the, the stream platform in IBM France would be a manager admin. Um, now, he or she then may add three standard admins, which are also in France, that are, you know, departmental level. So think like master, regional, department. And that's the sort of architecture, okay? There's a full sort of document on this, which if anybody gets into this with a customer, we can provide to help them walk through that process. But it's, um, it's very secure. It's very, uh, you know, fast onboarding, global onboarding versus regional onboarding. And it gives you uh, customers, large multinational com customers, the ability to control who has access to specific wallets by region. And just to give you a taste of that, if I sort of, you know, edit a, um, you know, uh, an admin's profile here and look at the, go into something called the custom access, you can see we have a lot of very granular access, which is very useful for large corporations that have different departments and only want this person to have access to this wallet and not have all the functionality, for example, down the left. So, a manager who's managing a regional office can say, add a new admin and say, well, that person has ability to, uh, you know, fund wallets, but can only fund with a credit card. It can't fund ICA. So very, very grand. And it actually reduces the menu options on the left here. So if the, the manager admin for standard turned off the ability to, to um, send funds then this menu option totally disappears. So it's very granular access right down to specific levels of viewing of accessing specific wallets, excuse this demo, it has a thousand wallets um, and so on. So this means that for a large corp, this is very much designed for large corporations, multi-department, multi-regional multi, uh, multi uh, companies that need this level of control, financial control over their money. It's like I said, it's, it's no different to having a, a bank account in many cases, having multiple wallets is like having multiple bank accounts, right? And so this is the sort of level of uh, um, you know, granular security we give around wallets in the system to get them comfortable with it. One of the things, Richard, that I wanted to point out, this is Scott, is that um, also every wallet, of course, has a unique identif identification number. And so, um, for instance, there are large companies that are with our clients. And so what happens is we have had some payments sent to the incorrect um, wallet. Right. So what happens is, is, is we find out from them, what wallet do you want um, that payment to be sent to? And I can speak from the E3 side, um, from what used to be Perks, uh, Perks Legacy. And you can go into the company payment settings under the administration side, and you can set that wallet for that particular partner. And then that problem is solved. So there right. is a solution for that also from our end. Okay. Yeah, and that's yeah, uh, that's so, and that's that's right. And and you know, wallets have wallet IDs, right? So to your point, if I look at this wallet here, the Sienna Demo wallet, the ID is that. So think of that almost like an account number. It is unique globally in the system. Okay, so any payment made to wallet eight five seven nine two will go to just this wallet. Okay, um, just like a bank account is unique, a wallet ID is unique globally as well. Um, so that's the way of, you know, like I said, yeah, 
And she, like you said, right? That's the way of ensuring payments get to the right, exactly the right wallet. Um, and, and like you said, you know, companies are receiving payments. After a while, they quickly catch on to the fact they can create multiple wallets and they like to create, you know, new ones for this, new ones for that. And suddenly they're asking you to pay one specific wallet versus just the default one. Okay. So the profile itself we touched on, this is, um, you know, the company beneficiary or remitter profile. It has the usual uh, stuff you'd expect, right? And some additional stuff. The uh, master admin, um, in this case, I'm logged in as a master admin. If I was logged in as a manager or a standard admin, it would be reflected there. Um, this information is um, not necessarily required for anything other than the master admin, okay? We don't ask for social security numbers of uh, standard and admins, et cetera. It's not required. It's just the master admin. We require stuff because we do KYC check on these individuals, okay? Um, the uh, Excuse the, the missing image here. Um, so this is the master admin. Um, the ticks represent the information we have to have, right? Uh, the company information is the same, right? We, we, we need certain information about companies that are onboarding for the purpose of making payments. And it's highlighted by the big green uh, tick, what we need. We need addresses. We may need, we typically need two out of three identity documents. Um, we have the three types that are accepted by the, the regulators here. One is that you just link a bank account. OK, if the company goes in and links a bank account, I'll show you how that's done in a moment. That in itself is considered a, a, a you know, a identity by proxy, right? That they've linked a bank account. Therefore, they must have access to that bank account. Um, and, uh, and therefore, that, that's a, a one identity, uh, accepted identity method. The second is to link a payment card, basically a credit or debit card. And the third is to upload an identity document. And you can, for companies, typically they'll, upload a document and the ones that most of them upload is like a tax document something that just has their tax number at the top it uh, doesn't have to show tax information but just shows the fact they are registered you know identified by the fact they are paying taxes right there are others driving license of the individual um, is another acceptable one so this is where the identity is added uh, a company um, can self-serve fill this out you can do it for them okay if you are onboarding one of your customers through the interface, you can upload documents on behalf of your customers, okay? So you can sort of white glove them through this process. Um, for remitters, all we need is a basic, um, excuse me, for beneficiaries, we don't really need very much, okay? The reason that beneficiaries um, of payments, receivers of payments should complete this is to increase the amount of money they're allowed to withdraw in one go, okay? I'll explain that a little more, right? So the regulators require that if you don't have a full block of information about a company, when they try and transfer to a bank, we have to set limits, maybe only $500 a day, only three transactions a week, and so on. It's called, the, obviously, limits of money. It's also called velocity, how often they make a, a withdrawal. So if a company ever comes to you and one of your, uh, you know, a, a cohesity beneficiary says, well, I try to withdraw the $50,000 I have, and it only let me do one. Well, the answer is complete your profile, complete your profile and your account identity level will go up. And if I look at the more info here, you'll see there are four levels of account identity, pending basic standard and advanced. They want to get their uh, profile complete and their uh, uh, identity level will increase to what we call advanced. And once it's at the advanced level, then those limits are much, much more relaxed, right? They'll be able to transfer, you know, a million dollars once a week and so on. So any customers ever say beneficiaries of payments, not the remitters, I can't withdraw money, say complete your profile. Just complete your profile. The more you complete it, the higher your identity account level, uh, your account identity level, and the more money you'll be able to withdraw and more often. Okay, so that's sort of intrinsically built into the system. And then we do it like this because we don't like to ask these beneficiaries for a whole ton of information up front to be able to use extreme. If you ask them for all this stuff up front, you know, it's very, very, uh, what's the word? It's very sort of, you know, it's a blocking mechanism. They're, they're not comfortable. They don't want to send us all this information. But if they've received $100,000 and they're asked for it to be able to withdraw it, they're pretty quick to realize, okay, well, I don't really have a lot of choice here. Um, and that's fine because the information is used for a very good reason. It's used to, for compliance. It's not used for anything, marketing or anything like that. Okay. So that's the basic profile for a company. If a customer wants to actually be a remitter, and this is what you're more interested in, they want to make payments, then they have to complete their advanced profile. Okay. Now, the advanced profile is... Um, Actually, not a whole heck of a lot more than the basics, to be honest. But here's the difference. This information is sent to a bank, 
Okay, so it's going to be shared. Okay, so when they fill out the advanced profile, they're actually onboarding with Extreme and the banks. Because in order to send money, you do have to be onboarded with a bank. Okay. Now they don't really know that it's in, in it's uh, it's a simple enough form. It asks for the address, city, town, state. Some of it's repetitive over uh, the, the basic um, profile, um, and we pre-fill it for them, and then they just finish and submit it. And this information doesn't just reside with Extreme; it is sent to the banks. They review it, and within 24 hours, they give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, or they may come back and say. Uh, yeah, we, we, there's a person we need more information on, or we need more information. They might ask us for additional information. Okay. It happens. You know, the regulators are very strict, right? And then we would come back to you and say, okay, you tried to onboard Acme Incorporation and we got the information, but they're asking for something, you know, this paperwork or that. So it might be a little too backwards and forwards, but once that's done um, and approved, then their advanced uh, companies, are, they're approved for advanced services. One of our services is remitting, making payments, um, and that goes back to, um, if I go back to the home here, if you see that it, once they are approved, you'll see a yellow star. That means this company has been advanced services approved, okay, which, which means they can send money and they've been onboarded with the bank. So this is all done through the back end. When, when you fill out an advanced services for your customers to get them as a remitter, it's transferred to the bank. This process is going in the background and, and we get you, them approved and you're off to the races. Okay. So onboarding. OK, it's um, simple enough. Sign up. The beneficiaries sign up through the system uh, just through the usual, uh, you know, uh, interface of extreme.com. Um, the. Um, in reality, um, the onboarding is even easier for beneficiaries. OK, and I'll explain that because what happens is, you know, you guys bring on board a new customer. OK. Um, and they say, oh, we want to pay 500 companies, okay? And we will ask for you to we'll ask you to submit, a, well, firstly, we'll onboard them. So we onboard the remitting company. They'll have to sign up at extreme.com or you may white glove through that process. They'll have to fill out the advanced profile, like I described, a couple of days, hopefully less, get approved. They're ready to go, ready to make remittance. The next thing is they'll submit a payment file today, maybe API future, but today's a payment file. And you guys generate that file in your system. You'll submit it through your login, 360 login. I'll come show that in a moment on behalf of them. Now, if you think about it, that file might contain the first time, you know, maybe 500 companies or maybe just 100, 100 companies. But those 100 companies, you know, 70 of them don't exist in extreme. They don't exist, right? Now, the 30 that do exist will just pay. The, 100, the 70 that uh, don't exist, we will dynamically create their company account for them. Um, and this is great because it means you don't have to go out and ask every single remit beneficiary of payment to go out and create an extreme account. We just need an email, the name, company name, amount, currency, and we'll create the account. And that person will be notified you've just received your first payment from the, your new customer. Uh, they will be asked to log into the system and there the money will be sent in the wallet. Okay. So we've made the onboarding process for the beneficiaries so much easier than asking them to have to sign up in advance, which is a sort of a chicken and egg situation which you get stuck in, you know. Um, so you can just pay everybody on behalf of your customers very, very quickly. Um, and then the beneficiary uh, logs in and they can see they've got money in their wallet and then they have to link their bank and transfer the money out, okay? And linking your bank is uh, a, a simple enough process. Um, if I go here, you go under the settings. I don't, yeah, I haven't showed you this, right? I'm not sure this is gonna work today, we'll see. Interesting. There you go. So this is the setting screen. Um, every account has a you know an org ID, which is an organization ID, um, and this is the link for uh, linking banks. Okay, so this is where you any beneficiary of payments one time links their banks. And the thing to know this notice this particular account. Uh, company has linked three banks. And if the bank is, if it says H, if it comes back and it's HV transfer, it's a bit technical really, but it means that there's a fee. That's the bottom line. If it says LV transfer, it means like no fee. Okay. So something to have in your mind, right? Um, for when they transferred out. But the linking bank process is, is very simple. You, you, you know, 
for standard tra bank transfer, you click on the second option, you fill out the country, the bank name. If it's a, a European bank, it might be an IBAN. You fill out the address of uh, you know, your address and you just walk through these steps and it's a one-time process. And once complete, it'll be represented here uh, as one of the linked banks, okay? Um, and you know, if you wanna then transfer money, because I have three banks linked here, uh, I'm gonna transfer money out of this wallet here, clearly, the standard transfer, the three banks will show up here. Okay, so I can just choose a specific bank and okay, this one's not working, but whatever. So this is this is how you go through the transfer process and that's how you link a bank. Okay. Um, I think that's about it for the demo. Okay, oh yeah, I'll touch on one thing, one final thing, excuse me, right? That is the connected architecture, yeah. So there's a link on the left here that says connected. If I go to... Um, uh, hit, uh, connected companies. This is going to be one of the most useful features to, to companies like yourselves at 360. This is a list of all your customers. You are connected to them. You're logged in as 360. You're connected to them. And because of that, they show up here. Okay, this demo has a, a lot of uh, linked companies, but you would have you know them listed here. And you have visibility into those companies that you would not normally have. For example, you can certainly... Um, you know, on their behalf, send payments. You can view their profile, you can view their wallets, you can view their linked banks, you can view their administrators, you can view their employees, you can edit their company details. So you have all these services are manager services, okay, that you can do on behalf of your customer. Um, and you'll see here exactly that. There's a manager services link. So imagine this would be, I keep using a cohesity, I apologize, but cohesity would be up here. And you have these manager services and these are specific to you. So you can, you know, if they sort of call you and say, I, we keep getting email alerts about, can you change their email alerts? Well, you can do it on their behalf, okay? If you want to customize their email alerts, you can do it through here. If you want to use the API, if you want to, and if you want to submit their advanced profile, okay? They've signed up, they want to start remitting, uh, remitting money. And they're, they're, oh, I have to fill out the advanced, okay, well, you can do it for them. You can walk them through that, submit it for them. You can get their funding bank details. If they say, what, where do I send money to? They, you can get it from them, uh, get it, those details uh, from this link. So these manager services are part of the connected architecture, if you remember, and they give you as uh, uh, 360 ability to manage your uh, connected customers without having to log into multiple sites. And in this particular case, I'm looking at Acme and Acme has a whole bunch of wallets, right? So this goes back to what I said before. If, if they call you, one of your customers, and says, uh, we paid a bunch of payments, but, but I, it looks like this didn't happen or this didn't happen. Then you can say, well, which wallet is it? Okay, it's 22251 or whichever wallet it is, um, more likely to be a USD wallet, right? Uh, and you can quickly jump into that particular wallet. I don't know if there's any activity here, but you could quickly jump into that wallet and, and see the activity that's going on. Okay, and this is a, a list here of the activity in that specific wallet. Uh, you can sort of filter it by date and so on. So you can manage your customers, downstream customers through this user interface, through the connected architecture. Okay, so that's what we call it. So if you ever hear us talking about the connected architecture, to summarize, it's just the ability for you to be connected to your customers so that you can support and manage them much more effectively than if you had to sort of log into their account, okay, and utilize all the manager services. And one thing, Richard, that I wanted to point out here is that, for instance, if we're paying one of the um, client partners, they are requesting information on a particular payment. You can click on details too, right. and it will list the exact claims that were paid underneath that particular reimbursement. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something that we'll do. I do it often. <laughs> so. You already do it. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, good. That's really all I have for the demo. I know there's a lot to consume here, um, but we're here for you, right? So we have a Slack channel connected with you guys um, to answer your support uh, requirements. We obviously have the support system as well. Um, so the Slack channel is specific to our integrated partners, so it's more real time. Um, and we certainly have, we also have a solutions uh, uh, system which uh, has a lot of documents on how things work. So if a customer starts asking about some specific compliance issues or something you can certainly just go to support.extreme.com and then search on compliance. And certainly those documents are, are useful, I think, in helping customers understand exactly uh, how that stuff kind of works. Great. That's all I got. Any and then Richard, questions? there are questions in the chat, so you may oh. want to check those. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have technically challenged here. All right, let me uh, move things out here. Okay. 
can they switch from one option to another? Is that, was that, that was Anne Slesberg? Um, is that like switching from op, uh, extreme direct to extreme choice maybe? That's when you said they can do the ACH or direct deposit. Uh, so like, can they switch back if they decided, okay, I wanted the ACH to my uh, bank account and then they come months later and say, hey, I want a card. Yeah, they possible? can, yeah. So if you're using choice, obviously direct is direct, right? So if you if you the instruction is to pay somebody direct to a card, then it's going to go straight to the card, you know. But certainly, if somebody has money in a in a wallet, they can even do you know sort of split it. You know, they have five thousand dollars, they can send four thousand nine hundred to their bank account and a hundred dollars to a gift card for the partner. You know, so they can just do as they see fit. Okay, thank you. Um, are 360 employees permitted to create wallets for a client? Um, yes, if it's if it's a, it's a it's a manager admin thing. If we turn it on for you, um, you know, so I think it's probably already on for you to be honest. Um, yes, so you can go into a connected account and create a wallet for them and name it. Um, uh, okay, I see there's an option to cancel the fund. Is there a window of time? Cancelling is yes. The 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 the. The, the funding notification is just notifying us you're sending us money, okay? So if you decide to fund a wallet on behalf of a customer, $100,000, and you and you go into extreme, click on fund, put in $100,000, you're just notifying us that you're sending us the money. You still haven't sent it to us. So if you then, uh, two days later or a day later, say, it could be a week later, right? Say, oh, you know, we're not going to send it. You can cancel it. Money hasn't arrived anyway, right? So there's really no window on how how quickly you you need to cancel the funding of a wallet. Okay. Um, so yeah, it can be cancelled anytime. Do I have a Teams channel? Uh, actually, we don't, but I will certainly look into that. Yeah, that's the Microsoft Teams, right? Yep. I'll look into that and see if we can do that. I don't see why not. Good question. We can you can we can you slap on the web and it's just not as a company in yet. Okay, I think well our Slack channel is sort of a. I mean it's it, yeah. I mean you can access it just with a personal email. It, yeah, um, that's sort of a policy issue, I guess, for maybe E three sixty whether that's okay. Uh, but let me look into the Microsoft Teams thing. I don't see a problem with that. Are there any logs that can notify us when certain actions are performed by other users, such as registration admin or linking a bank or making a transfer? Um, yeah, there are. I mean, the logging is actually, it's, it's a good question, actually. We're actually, well, it's one of the other systems we're enhancing. Right now, the logs are, everything is logged into Splunk. So we have an external platform for tr every single transaction log. Um, but what we're going to do is uh, display, what, one of the features coming up is to display all of that inside Extreme. Okay, so the answer is, Yes, we have the extreme has that data. So if you were to call us and say, well, something happened and we don't understand what I should, we, we have that data. What we're going to add is to make it literally in the platform for you under logging. Okay. So look out for that in the next uh, so three months. Are there approval structures? Um, yes, there are. The, the biggest uh, area, the single place that, that comes up the most is transferring funds out of extreme. Okay. So because what, when money's in extreme, it's in our ecosystem, the, the, the chance of sort of um, nefarious behavior is limited because it's, it's still in our world. So we can undo bad transactions, right? The challenge is when somebody transfers it to a bank, okay? Imagine one of your customers, um, you know, somebody nefariously links their own personal bank and transfer it, right? So for that reason, there's what we call the four eyes. Uh, I don't like that expression. It's, it's a secondary approval, okay? So it's having two people review it. So yes, the answer is it on bank transfers, you can say you can set it so that a secondary person has to improve, approve that bank transfer. Um, and that's the one area where we've got uh, one specific feature where we've got two requirement, uh, you know, the, the feature to uh, control that. Uh, okay, that's that's all the questions in chat, I think. Uh, Rick, I have uh, two questions. Sure. <laughs> um, the first one is translations. Is this is there a way for the site to be translated, and for email notifications, and then also for the support team, your support team, do do they translate as well? Um, 
as the product manager, I can tell you, I, we don't do that, okay? Um, the reason being is that the two things. One is that the majority of our customers are using our embedded APIs, so there's no translation to be done. Their platform is doing all the translation for their screens, okay? That's one. On the platform itself, when people are logging in, we just rely on the browser to do the trans translation, okay? Um, we don't have, you know, resource files and translation. We just consider it an enormous cost to do it and versus just the browser translating. And the, one of the things is there's just not a lot of text in Extreme. So if you're in France and you're using a, a French browser, and we've tested this, it's, it's pretty good, right? It's 95% good enough. And I wasn't actually, as, you know, it's my decision, right? But it may prove to be wrong that we decided it wasn't worth going the extra 5% for the cost associated with doing it. Um, I'd be interested to know what you think about that. Yeah. I went, well, it's just a question with a question that came up recently and we right. weren't for sure the answer yet. And so we can just go back and say it's English only. Yeah. Yeah. Or the browser does it. I mean, if you're in or France, the browser, yeah. the browser yeah. just converts it completely and it's pretty good. It didn't right. used to be good. I mean, Google did a pretty good job. There was, when that first came out, that feature was terrible, right? But I think <laughs> it's pretty good now. So maybe interested. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And then my second question is... Um, so uh, it has to do with reporting. Right. Um, currently, we send, it's very important for our partners, beneficiaries to know what claim number we're, they're receiving payment on. And we're currently we're sending that as a description on the right. transaction. Is there a report available that captures that description? I, 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 yeah, I think so. But I would have to literally go through this specifically with you. I mean, have you actually taken a look at all the available reports in the system? Not all of them. There's a couple that I use. And of course, the description isn't on there. But, you know, I haven't what, gone through every single one. I think that's something where you may want to take because we can always fix it if it's not right. But the what, what okay. we typically do is we have in the reports, we sort of provide um, um, a bunch of reports and, and they're split by you uh this account the beneficiaries that you're um paying to and your connected company account so the reason that you have that's a good one because if you're logged into 360 you're going to want reports on cohesity not your yourself okay so that's what that option is for but what we do is we provide reports that have on the screen a certain amount of data as really based on what you can fit on a screen and but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot more data behind the records right so there's a download button is what I'm trying to get to. And if you if you sort of play with the reports, if you, if you don't see the data you want in the screen table, then click on the download button because that it will download a CSV um, with a lot more data in it. Maybe the data you want. OK. And if you don't see the, the data you want, let us know. OK. So, OK, I downloaded it and it's missing this data. OK. And we'll add it. OK. OK. Good so, so, so check out the reports, check out the download, import it into Excel and take a look. Okay, let us know. Okay, thank you, Rick. Right, thank you. Hi, Rick, I have a question. This is Grace, and I apologize if I missed this earlier on. Um, but if we, if we were setting up a completely brand new client, what is, what is the time frame to get them set up in the system based on the required documents that they need? Well, we... We typically say 24 to 48 hours. I mean, the process is this. One, get them to the extreme.com and to register their company, to sign up, okay? Choose their master admin and sign up, okay? Now, you may want to do it for them, but I recommend maybe you want to have them do that. Um, secondly, have them or you through the 360 interface fill out the advanced profile, the profile and the advanced profile, okay? The advanced profile is key to being a remitter and for your customers, right? The ones that are sending, and, that, and then once you've submitted that, that's sent to the banks, it usually takes from 24 to 48 hours for them to, and it's all done automatically. It comes back into our system through the APIs as approved. Um, that's usually it, it's 48 hours, okay? The only time that we go outside of that is sometimes the, the uh, banks will say, can you send us some additional information, okay? And it's sort of like, um, you know, typically to simply answer your question, 24 to 48 hours, but if there's any red flags, okay, on an account, it can take a little longer because they have, then you, 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 it moves to another department at the banks and the, and the 
the guys start looking at everything really closely, right? It's happened, it's happened probably about 10, 12 times since I've been here. Um, and it's usually related to the company has a subsidiary in a restricted country, okay? The, this, is a, this is, comes back from ultimately from the government, right? I'm giving you too much information. But, you know, if a company has a subsidiary in Afghanistan, I just randomly pick it on Afghanistan, then that will cause a red flag. And then the process might take days, even weeks, okay? Um, but normally 48 hours. Yeah. And that that wouldn't quite that would include I shouldn't say it should include because I know it can go a different direction. But at what point does the bank do the vetting of you know who the the ownerships are and if a UBO is required and whatnot? Is it through the the account setup? Yeah, I mean they it it is that advanced profile. So they you fill out the advanced profile. Um, the, the the advanced profile itself. The regulations have changed recently. That's why I'm pausing here, right? So in the system itself, um, I don't know if I can demonstrate this, but under the advanced profile, uh, yeah, this is just misbehaving big time. Okay. It's my Windows implementation, right? But um, under the advanced profile, the information that, that you select which country you're in, okay, you know, USA, France, Germany, and, it, and the amount of data required will vary based on which country you choose, okay? And it's sent to the banks and then they, um, based on the you know, data, they will approve or, or not within 48 hours, okay? Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Just trying to understand, like a, it sounds like in the, in the profile or the, the registration process, that's when it's, it, it, it could either come back um, if additional details is required, right? So for example, if there's part ownership or a, a, a yeah. specific number of ownership, which requires a different vetting process. And I was just trying to gauge where, where that vetting process happens, but it sounds like it happens at the registration profile uh, point, right? Which it does, it does. It's, it's the advanced profile. When they complete the advanced profile here, at the bottom of the advanced profile, I'm sorry, sorry my computer is really uh, having a bad time here, but at the bottom of the advanced profile, when you hit that finish the submit button, that's mm -hmm. when it's sent to the bank. Okay, that's yeah. the very moment it's sent to the bank. And it will come up here and say, you know, in process, you know, it's advanced services, it will say in process, right? Tell them it's in process. And then when it's approved, an email is sent to uh, the master admin of the company saying, this has been approved. You've been approved for advanced services. And when they come in here, it'll say, you know, you're, you're approved. Okay. So the moment you hit that submit button, uh, finish and submit is when it goes off to the banks uh, and they do their work. Okay. Thank okay. you. Uh, one quick question. You mentioned um, the idea of um, us registering on behalf of, of the clients, um, either the initial registration or helping them with the advanced um, profile. Um, is there any kind of like terms and conditions that we wouldn't want, you know, to get in between there or reasons for them to do it themselves as opposed to us doing it on behalf of them? Well, I, to be honest, I think I, I sort of shouldn't have, I spoke out of turn there. For the initial thing, I would always have the company them register. And the reason being is that the email on the account domain must be the actual company's domain. Okay. So it, you can't register for an email using an email that's not the company's email. Okay, so I should I, I spoke out of turn there, right? So the initial registration must be done by the actual company, um, and uh, having a correct email, you know, identified email with the account is part of the of the um, you know part of requirement for approval. Okay, um, they can't use Gmail. You can't have people with companies at Gmail at AOL. None of those will work. Okay, um, it must be at the domain of the actual company name. What happens is the regulators, you know, if it's built at uh, Microsoft.com, they will literally go to Microsoft.com and see it's an existing business with a website. Okay, if there's no website, that's a problem. Okay, it's it's uh, part of the requirement. So I would say to your customer, please go to Extreme.com, choose your master administrator, and register. Now, once they've registered and logged in, they, then they then you can connect to them. Send them a connect request. You can you can sort of search on them under, uh, you know, under the company list. You can search them up here. They've just registered. You can search them up here, and then you can uh, send a send a request to be connected to them. Uh, they can accept that request, or 
yeah. And, and then from that point on, um, you can then go to their account and submit the advanced profile for them. Or you can just ask them to do it. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, you can see here, this is, this is an advanced profile for the US. Okay. So it's really pretty simple. You know, it's just address and so on. Um, some countries, if you start to choose, uh, if they're based in a different country, like the UK, then the step, the process for the advanced profile is a little more involved. Okay. The reason I'm hesitating is that it, it's looking like the process for US companies is going to become a little more involved. There were some regulatory requirements recently, which means that we may have to switch the, the US um, advanced services to be more look more like this one, where there's a six-step process and it's a little bit more information. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit more involved. Um, certainly you can save, save it. If, you, if you're doing this on behalf of your customer, and you don't have all the data, you can sort of save it mid-application and then, and then come back to it later. I can tell you that I don't believe any of the Perks Legacy that we have done any of this for our clients. Yeah. And, and so what's going on here is the regulatory, if you look at the US requirement form, okay, if I go back to the US form here, I'm, I'm giving you a little bit more information you need because it's still up in the air, right? But I'm just sort of warning you, I guess. Right now, if, you, if you're, you know, in the, if I go back to the advanced profile, um, you, you, the form that was on there was relatively straightforward. United States form, it just asks for city, down, address, authorized contact information, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward, right? But it's, it's appearing that it might, and, and if you choose a non-US, uh, I pick, pick on the UK, you'll see it's more advanced and they're asking for, uh, you know, UBO, et cetera, right? Um, and, but I think you're gonna, we're going to find in the next uh, few months that this longer application might apply to the US as well. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, you'll be the first to know. I'll let you know. Okay. And that's, like I said, it's a little out of our control. And then for those who don't use Extreme 2, I just wanted to point out, um, just so that people are aware, the OSM or the OSP, they, we don't load the files to Extreme. That's done by finance. Oh, okay. Yeah, we don't actually load the files our Ourselves. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Great. Any other questions? Good. Kate, are we are we good? Yeah, I think we're good. If there's no more questions, um, would you mind sharing the recording, and I can yeah, make sure I'll, make that yeah. available for people and the deck, if you don't mind. Um, and I can chuck in there the link to the support the support site so that people do want to have a look at some of the sort of more detailed um, bits on the various components and they can they can find that resource for themselves awesome all right well right. thanks so much it was yeah, our a, pleasure our pleasure there was a lot of talking so thank yeah. you Richard <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to drink some water now there you go <laughs> really all right, guys. Thanks ever so much, everybody. Appreciate Thank all you. your time. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Again. Thanks, Richard. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.